Bad Influence When I was sent to spend the summer at my grandparents' house in Puerto Rico, I knew it was going to be strange. I just didn't know how strange. My parents insisted that I was going to go either to a Catholic girls' retreat or to my mother's folks on the island. Some choice. It was either breakfast, lunch, and dinner with the Sisters of Charity in a convent somewhere in the woods, far from beautiful downtown Patterson, New Jersey, where I really wanted to spend my summer, or arroz y habichuelas with the old people in the countryside of my parents' island. My whole life I had seen my grandparents only once a year when we went down for a two-week vacation, and frankly, I spent all my time at the beach with my cousins and let the adults sit around drinking their hot café con leche and sweating, gossiping about people I didn't know. This time there would be no cousins to hang around with. Vacation time for the rest of the family was almost three months away. It was going to be a long, hot summer. Did I say hot? When I stepped off that airplane in San Juan, it was like I had opened an oven door. I was immediately drenched in sweat and felt like I was breathing water. To make matters worse, there were Papa Juan, Mama Ana, and about a dozen other people waiting to hug me and ask me a million questions in Spanish, not my best language. The others were vecinos, neighbors who had nothing better to do than come to the airport to pick me up in a caravan of cars. My friends from Central High would have died laughing if they had seen the women with their fans going back and forth across their shiny faces, fighting over who was going to take my bags and who was going to sit next to whom in the cars for the 15-minute drive home. Someone put a chubby brown baby on my lap, and even though I tried to ignore her, she curled up around me like a koala bear and went to sleep. I felt her little chest going up and down, and I made my breath match hers. I sat in the back of Papa Juan's un-air-conditioned, sub-compact, in-between Doña This and Doña That, practicing Zen. I had been reading about it in a magazine on the airplane, about how to lower your blood pressure by concentrating on your breathing, so I decided to give it a try. My grandmother turned around with a worried look on her face and said, Rita, do you have asthma? Your mother didn't tell me. Before I could say anything, Everybody in the car started talking at once, telling asthma stories. I continued to take deep breaths, but it didn't help. By the time we got to Mama Anna's house, I had a pounding headache. I excused myself from my welcoming committee, handed the damp baby, she was really cute, over to her grandmother, and went to lie down in the room where Papa Juan had put my bags. Of course, there was no AC. The window was thrown wide open, and right outside, Perched on a fence separating our house from the neighbors by about six inches, there was a red rooster. When I looked at him, he started screeching at the top of his lungs. I closed the window, but I could still hear him crowing. Then someone turned on a radio, loud. I put a pillow over my head and decided to commit suicide by sweating to death. I must have dozed off because when I opened my eyes, I saw my grandfather sitting on a chair outside my window, which had been opened again. He was stroking the rooster's feathers and seemed to be whispering something in his ear. He finally noticed me sitting in a daze on the edge of my four-poster bed, which was about ten feet off the ground. "'You were dreaming about your boyfriend,' he said to me. "'It was not a pleasant dream. "'No, I don't think it was muy bueno.' "'Great.' My mother hadn't told me that her father had gone senile. But I had been dreaming about Johnny Ruiz, one of the reasons I had been sent away for the summer. Just a coincidence, I decided. But what about privacy? Had I, or had I not, closed the window in my room? Papa, I said assertively, I think we need to talk. There is no need to talk when you can see into people's hearts, he said, setting the rooster on my window ledge. This is Ramon. He is a good rooster and makes the hens happy and productive, but Ramon has a little problem that you will soon notice. He cannot tell time very accurately. To him, day is night and night is day. It is all the same to him, and when the spirit moves him, he sings. This is not a bad thing in itself, entiendes? But it sometimes annoys people. Entonces, I have to come and calm him down. I could not believe what I was hearing. 
It was like I was in a Star Trek rerun where reality is being controlled by an alien and you don't know why weird things are happening all around you until the end of the show. Ramon jumped into my room and up on my bed where he spread his wings and crowed like a madman. He is welcoming you to Puerto Rico, my grandfather said. I decided to go sit in the living room. I have prepared a special tea for your asthma. Mama Anna came in carrying a cup of some foul-smelling green stuff. I don't have asthma, I tried to explain, but she had already set the cup in my hands and was on her way to the TV. My telenovela comes on at this hour, she announced. Mama Anna turned the volume way up as the theme music came on, with violins wailing like cats mating. I had always suspected that all my Puerto Rican relatives were a little bit deaf. She sat in a rocking chair right next to the sofa where I was lying down. I was still feeling like a wet noodle from the heat. Drink your guarapo while it's still hot, she insisted, her eyes glued to the TV screen where a girl was crying about something. Pobrecita, my grandmother said sadly. Her miserable husband left her without a penny, and she's got three little children and one on the way. Oh, God, I groaned. It was really going to be the twilight zone around here. Neither one of the old guys could tell the difference between fantasy and reality. Papa with his dream reading and Mama with her telenovelas. I had to call my mother and tell her that I had changed my mind about the convent. I was going to have to locate a telephone first, though. AT&T had not yet sold my grandparents on the concept of high-tech communications. Letters were still good enough for them, and a telegram when someone died. The nearest phone was at the house of a neighbor, a nice fat woman who watched you while you talked. I had tried calling a friend last summer from her house. There had been a conversation going on in the same room where I was using the phone, a running commentary on what I was saying in English as understood by her granddaughter. They had both thought that eavesdropping on me was a good way to practice their English. My mother had explained that it was not malicious. It was just that people on the island did not see as much need for privacy as people who lived on the mainland. Puerto Ricans are friendlier. Keeping secrets among friends is considered offensive, she had told me. My grandmother explained the suffering woman's problems in the telenovela. She'd had to get married because the man she loved was a villain who had forced her to prove her love for him. Tu sabes como. You know how. Then he had kept her practically a prisoner, isolated from her own familia. Ay, bendito, my grandmother exclaimed as the evil husband came home and started demanding food on the table and a fresh suit of clothes. He was going out, he said, with los muchachos. Pero no. My grandmother knew better than that. He had another woman. She was sure of it. She spoke to the crying woman on the TV. Mira, she advised her. Open your eyes and see what is going on. For the sake of your children, leave this man. Go back home to your mamá. She's a good woman, although you have hurt her and she is ill, perhaps with cancer. But she will take you and the children back. Oh, I moaned. Sit up and drink your tea, Rita. If you're not better by tomorrow, I'll have to take you to my comadre. She makes the best herbal laxatives on the island. People come from all over to buy them, because what ails most people is a clogged system. You clean it out like a pipe, entiendes? You flush it out, and then you feel good again. I'm going to bed, I announced, even though it was only nine, hours before my usual bedtime. I could hear Ramon crowing from the direction of my bedroom. Mm, it's a good idea to get some rest tonight, hija. Tomorrow Juan has to do a job out by the beach, a woman whose daughter won't eat or get out of bed. They think it is a spiritual matter. You and I will go with him. I have a craving for crab meat, and we can pick some up. Pick some up? See, si, when the crabs crawl out of their holes and into our traps. We'll take some pots and boil them on the beach. They'll be sabrosos. I'm going to bed now, I repeated like a zombie. I took a running start from the door and jumped on the bed with all my clothes on. Outside my window, Ramon crowed. The neighbor woman called out, Anna, Anna, do you think she'll leave him? While my grandmother yelled back, No, pienso que no. She's a fool for love, that one is. I shut my eyes and tried to fly back to my room at home. 
when I had my own telephone, I could sometimes sneak a call to Johnny late at night. He had basketball practice every afternoon, so we couldn't talk earlier. I was desperate to be with him. He was on the varsity team at Eastside High and a very popular guy. That's how we met, at a game. I had gone with my friend Melly from Central because her boyfriend played for Eastside too. He was an Anglo, though. Actually, he was Italian, but looked Puerto Rican. Neither of the guys was exactly into meeting parents, and our folks didn't let us go out with anybody whose total ancestry they didn't know. So Melly and I had to sneak out and meet them after games. Dating is not a concept adults in our barrio really get. It's supposed to be that a girl meets a guy from the neighborhood, and their parents went to school together, and everybody knows everybody's business. But Melly and I were doing all right until Joey and Johnny asked us to spend the night in Joey's house. The Molieri's had gone out of town, and we would have the place to ourselves. Melly and I talked about it constantly for days, until we came up with a plan. It was risky, but we thought we could get away with it. We each said we were spending the night at the other's house. We'd done it a lot of times before, and our mothers never checked on us. They just told us to call if anything went wrong. Well, it turned out Melly's mom got a case of heartburn that she thought was a heart attack, and her husband called our house. She almost did have one for real when she found out Melly wasn't there. They called the cops and woke up everybody they thought we knew. When Melly's little sister cracked under pressure and mentioned Joey Molieri, all four of them drove over to West Patterson at 2 a.m. and pounded on the door like crazy people. The guys thought it was a drug bust. But I knew, and when I looked at Melly and saw the look of terror on her face, I knew she knew what we were in for. We were put under house arrest after that, not even allowed to make phone calls, which I think is against the law. Anyway, it was a mess. That's when I was given the two choices for my summer. And naturally, I picked the winner, spending three months with two batty old people and one demented rooster. The worst part is that I didn't deserve it. My mother interrogated me about what had happened between me and that boy, as she called him. Nothing. I admit that I was thinking about it. Johnny had told me that he liked me and wanted to take me out, but he usually dated older girls, and he expected them to have sex with him. Apparently, he and Joey had practiced their speeches together, because Melly and I compared notes in the bathroom at one point, and she had heard the same thing from him. But our parents had descended on us while we were still discussing it. Would I do it? To have a boyfriend like Johnny Ruiz? He can go out with any girl. White, black, or Puerto Rican. But he says I'm mature for almost 15. After the mess, I snuck a call to him one night when my mother had forgotten to unplug the phone and lock it up like she'd been doing whenever she had to leave me alone in the apartment. Johnny said he thinks my parents are nuts, but he's willing to give me another chance when I come back in the fall. We'll be getting up real early tomorrow. My grandmother was at my door. Barged in without knocking, of course. We'll be up with the chickens so we can catch the crabs when the sun brings them out. Está bien? Then she came to sit on my bed, which took some doing since it was almost as tall as she. I am glad that you are here, mi niña. She grabbed my head and kissed me hard on my cheek. She smelled like coffee with boiled milk and sugar, which the natives drink by the gallon in spite of the heat. I was thinking that my grandmother didn't remember that I was almost 15 years old, and I would have to remind her. But then she got serious and said to me, I was your age when I met Juan. I married him a year later and started having babies. They're scattered all over Los Estados Unidos now. Did I ever tell you that I wanted to be a professional dancer? At your age, I was winning contests and traveling with a mambo band. Do you dance, Rita? You should, sabes? It's hard to be unhappy when your feet are moving to music. I was more than a little surprised by what Mama Anna said about wanting to be a dancer and marrying at 15, and wouldn't have minded hearing more. But then Papa Juan came into my room, too. I guessed it was going to be a party, so I sat up and turned on the light. Where is my bottle of holy water, Anna? he asked. On the altar in our room, senor, she replied, where it always is. Of course, I thought, 
The holy water was on the altar, where everybody keeps their holy water. I must have made a funny noise, because both of them turned their eyes to me, looking very concerned. Is it that asthma again, Rita? My grandmother felt my forehead. I noticed you didn't finish your tea. I'll go make you some more as soon as I help your abuelo find his things for tomorrow. I'm not sick, please. Just a little tired, I said firmly, hoping to get my message across. But I had to know. What is it he's going to do tomorrow? Exercise demons out of somebody or what? They looked at each other then as if I was crazy. You explain it to her, Anna, he said. I have to prepare myself for this trabajo. My grandmother came back to the bed, climbed up on it, and began telling me how Papa was a medium, a spiritist. He had special gifts, facultades, which he had discovered as a young man that allowed him to see into people's hearts and minds through prayers and in dreams. Does he sacrifice chickens and goats? I had heard about these voodoo priests who went into trances and poured blood and feathers all over everybody in secret ceremonies. There was a black man from Haiti in our neighborhood who people said could even call back the dead and make them his zombie slaves. There was always a dare on to go to his door on some excuse and try to see what was in his basement apartment, but nobody I knew had ever done it. What had my own mother sent me into? I would probably be sent back to Patterson as one of the walking dead. No, Dios mío, no, Mama Anna shouted and crossed herself and kissed the cross on her neck chain. Your grandfather works with God and his saints, not with Satan. Excuse me, I said, thinking that I really should have been given an instruction manual before being sent here on my own. Tomorrow you will see how Juan helps people. This muchacha that he has been summoned to work on has stopped eating. She does not want to speak to her mother, who is the one who called us. Your grandfather will see what is making her spirit sick. Why don't they take her to a... I didn't know the word for shrink in Spanish, so I just said, to a doctor for crazy people. Because not everyone who is sad or troubled is crazy. If it is their brain that is sick, that is one thing. But if it is their soul that is in pain, then Juan can sometimes help. He can contact the guides, that is, spirits who are concerned about the ailing person, and they can sometimes show him what needs to be done. Entiendes? Uh-huh, I said. She planted another smack on my face and left to help her husband pack his Ghostbuster equipment. I finally fell asleep, thinking about Johnny and what it would be like to be his girlfriend. Getting up with the chickens meant that both my grandparents were up and talking at the top of their lungs by about four in the morning. I put my head under the sheet and hoped that my presence in their house had slipped their minds. No luck. Mama Anna came into my room, turned on the overhead light, and pulled down the sheet. It had been years since my own parents had dared to barge into my bedroom. I would have been furious, except I was so sleepy I couldn't build up to it, so I just curled up and decided it was time to use certain things to my advantage. Oh, I moaned and gasped for air. Hija, what is wrong? Mama sounded so worried that I almost gave up my little plan. It's my asthma, Mama, I said in a weak voice. I guess all the excitement is making it act up. I'll just take my medicine and stay in bed today. <gasps> Positivamente no, she said putting a hand that smelled of mint from her garden on my forehead. I will stay with you and have my comadre come over. She will prepare you a tea that will clear your system like... like a clogged sewer pipe. I completed the sentence for her. No, I'll go with you. I'm feeling better now. Are you sure, Rita? You are more important to me than any poor girl sick in her soul. And I don't need to eat crab either. Once in a while, I get these antojos, you know, whims, like a pregnant woman. Ha <laughs> ha. But they pass. Somehow we got out of the house before the sun came up and sandwiched ourselves into the subcompact, whose muffler must have woken up half the island. Why doesn't anyone ever mention noise pollution around here, was my last thought, before I fell asleep, crunched up in the back seat. When I opened my eyes, I was blinded by the glare of the sun coming through the car windows, and when my eyeballs came back into their sockets, 
I saw that we had pulled up at the side of a house right on the beach. This was no ordinary house. It looked like a pink and white birthday cake. No joke. It was painted baby pink with white trim and a white roof. It had a terrace that went all the way around it so that it really did look like a layer cake. If I could afford a house like that, I would paint it a more serious color, like purple. But around here, everyone is crazy about pastels. Lime green, baby pink, and blue. Nursery school colors. The ocean was incredible, though. It was just a few yards away, and it looked unreal. The water was turquoise in some places, and dark blue, almost black in others. I guess those were the deep spots. I had been left alone in the car, so I looked around to see if the old people were anywhere in sight. I saw my grandmother first, off on the far left side of the beach where it started to curve, up to her knees in water, dragging something by a rope. Catching crabs, I guessed. I needed to stretch, so I walked over to where she was. Although the sun was a little white ball in the sky, it wasn't unbearably hot yet. In fact, with the breeze blowing, it was almost perfect. I wondered if I could get them to leave me here. Then I remembered the job my grandfather had come to do. I glanced up at the top layer of the cake, where I thought the bedroom would be, to see if anything was flying out of the windows. Morning was a strange time for weird stuff, but no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't feel down about anything right then. It was so sunny, and the whole beach was empty, except for one old lady out there violating the civil rights of sea creatures, and me. Mira! Mira! Mama Anna yelled, pulling a cage-like box out of the water. Claws stuck through the slats, snapping like scissors. She looked very proud. So even though I didn't approve of what was going to happen to her prisoners, I said, Wow, I'm impressed, or something stupid like that. They'll have to boil for a long time before we can sink our teeth into them, she said, a cold-blooded killer look in her eye. But then we'll have a banquet right here on the beach. I can't wait, I said, moving toward the nearest palm tree. The trees grow right next to the water here. It looked wild, like it must have when Columbus dropped in. If you didn't look at the pink house, you could imagine yourself on a deserted tropical island. I lay down on one of the big towels she had spread out, and soon she came over and sat down real close to me. She got her thermos out of a sack and two plastic cups. She poured us some café con leche, which I usually hate because it's like ultra-sweet milk with a little coffee added for color or something. Nobody here asks you if you want cream or sugar in your coffee. The coffee is 99% cream and sugar. Take it or leave it. But at that hour on that beach, it tasted just right. Where is Papa? I was getting curious about what he was doing in the pink house and about who lived there. He is having a session with the senora and her daughter. That poor niña is not doing very well. Pobrecita, poor little thing. I saw her when I helped him bring his things in this morning. She is a skeleton, only 16, and she has packed her bags for the other world. She's that sick? Maybe they ought to take her to the hospital. How is your asthma, mi amor? She said, apparently reminded of my own serious illness. Great. My asthma is great. I poured myself another cup of coffee. So, why don't they get a doctor for this girl? I was getting pretty good at keeping conversations more or less on track with at least one person. What exactly are her symptoms? There was a man there, she said, totally ignoring my question. Not her papa. A man with a look that said mala influencia all over it. She shook her head and made a sound. This real-life telenovela was beginning to get interesting. You mean he's a bad influence on the girl? It is hard to explain, hija. A mala influencia is something that some people who are sensitive to spiritual matters can feel when they go into a house. Juan and I both felt chilled in there. She nodded toward the pink house. Maybe they have air conditioning, I said. And the feeling of evil got stronger when ese hombre, that strange man, came into the room, she added. Who is he? The mother's boyfriend. So, 
what's going to happen now? It depends on what Juan decides is wrong with this casa. The mother is not very stable. She has money from a former husband, so it is not from physical need that these women suffer. La señora is fortunately a believer, and that is good for her daughter. Why? Because she may do what needs to be done, if not for herself, then for her child. When a mala influencia takes over a house, pues, it affects everyone in it. Tell me some things that may happen, mamá. It was so strange that this rich woman had asked my grandfather to come solve her problems. I mean, if things were going this crazy wrong, someone should call a shrink, right? Here, they got the local medicine man to make a house call. Well, Juan will interview each of the people under the mala influencia, separately, so they don't get their stories tangled up, ¿sabes? Then he will decide which spirits need to be contacted for help. Oh, I said, like it all sounded logical to me. Actually, I thought all Mama had said was not too exciting for a supernatural event. Until she got to the part about contacting the spirits, that is. In most of these cases where a restless or bad spirit has settled over a house, it's just a matter of figuring out what it wants or needs. Then you have to help it to find its way to God by giving it a way out, giving it light. The home is purified of the bad influence, and peace returns. We had a few minutes of quiet then, since she apparently thought she had made it all crystal clear to me, and I was trying to absorb some of the mumbo-jumbo I had just heard. But I got distracted looking at how the sunlight was sparkling off the water. I was feeling pretty good. Must be the caffeine kicking in, I thought. Then, my grandmother pulled me up by the hand. For a pudgy old lady, she was pretty strong. We have to bring dinner in. So for a while, we dragged the crab traps out. She wouldn't let me touch the crabs, since I didn't know how to handle them. Might bite your fingers off, she explained calmly. So I went for a long walk down the beach. It turned out to be part of an inlet, which was why the water was so still, almost no waves. And I actually found some shells. This was new to me, since the public beach my cousins and I went to was swept clean of trash and everything else every morning. Sand was all that was left, until it was covered by empty cans, bags, disposable diapers, and all the other things people bring for a day at the beach and leave behind as a little gift to Mother Nature. But this was different. How could that girl in the pink house be so unhappy when she could wake up to this every morning? I sat down on a sea-washed rock that was so smooth and comfortable I could just lounge on it all day. I stared out as far as I could see, and I thought I saw something jump out of the water. Not just one, but two or three dolphins, just like at SeaWorld. They jumped out, made a sort of half circle in the air, then went back under. I couldn't believe it. I ran back to my grandmother, who was stirring a big black pot over a fire, looking like the witch cooking something tasty for Hansel and Gretel. Gasping for air, which made her frown, that old asthma again, I told her what I had seen. I didn't know the Spanish word for dolphin, so I said, flipper. Ah, si, flipper, she said, rolling that R forever like they do here. Delfines. She knew what I was talking about. They like these waters, no fishermen, except for me, ha ha. I avoided looking into the pot. Strange sounds were coming from it. Wow, I said to myself, dolphins. I couldn't wait to tell Melly. I had seen real wild dolphins. Mama Anna handed me a sandwich, and after I ate it, I fell asleep on the towel. I woke up when I heard Papa Juan's voice. I pretended to be still sleeping so I could listen in on an uncensored version of the weird stuff happening in the pink house. Mama Anna had made a tent over our spot on the beach with four sticks and a blanket. She was working over the campfire, pouring things into the pot. I was getting hungry. Whatever she was cooking smelled great. Papa Juan was writing things in a notebook with a pencil that he kept wetting by putting it into his mouth. I was watching them from the corner of my eyes, not moving. It was Mama who spoke first. It's that man, verdad? She spoke very softly. I guess she didn't want to wake me up, 
I had to really strain to hear. I have told the mother that her house needs a spiritual cleansing. The mala influencia has settled over the young girl, but the evil has spread over everything. It is a very cold house. I felt it too, Mama said, making the sign of the cross over her face and chest. It is the man who is the agent. He has brought bad ways with him. He has frightened the girl. She will not tell me how. I saw a bruise on her arm. See. My grandfather put his notebook down and seemed to go into a trance or something. He closed his eyes and let his head drop. His lips were moving. I watched Mama to see what she would do, but she continued cooking like nothing unusual was happening. Then he sort of shook his head like he was just trying to wake up and went back to writing in his notebook. Have you decided what to do? Mama came to sit next to him and peeked over her shoulder at the notebook. She nodded, agreeing with whatever it was. I will tell the mother that she must not allow this man into the house any more. Then I will prepare the herbs for her so that next Tuesday and Friday she can clean the house and fumigate. What about the niña? Mama asked. They had their heads together like two doctors discussing a patient. I will treat her with some of our comadre's tea. I will also tell her that the only way for us to get rid of the evil in the house is with her help. She will have to work with her mother. The woman will not want to throw the man out. You will have to help me convince her of the consequences if she doesn't, Anna. She is a believer. And although she is misguided, she loves her daughter. We have to bring light into this home, Juan. The girl saw Rita from the window. She asked who she was, my grandfather said. Let us send our niña to invite Angela for dinner. Good idea, said Mama. Great, I thought. Great idea. Send me over to get the girl from the exorcist. Good way to ruin my day at the beach. Rita, hija, Mama called out loudly. Time to wake up. The house was pale pink on the inside, too. The woman who answered my knock was a surprise. She looked elegant in a white sundress. She also looked familiar to me. I guess I must have stared because she said, I'm Maribel Hernandez Jones, like I should recognize the name. Seeing that I didn't, she added, You may know me from TV. I do toothpaste commercials. That was it. Her commercial had come on about five times during the telenovela. I'm Rita. My grandmother wants to know if Angela would like to eat with us. The smile faded into a sad look, but she pointed to a closed door at the other end of the room. The place was like a dollhouse. All the furniture was white and looked like no one ever sat on it. The girl must have heard me, or else been spying from her window, because I'd barely gotten to her door when she flew out, grabbing my hand. We were out of the house before I ever got a good look at her. Shorter than I was by about four inches, she was very thin. She had long black hair and beautiful sort of bronze skin. Still, she looked kind of pale, too, like you do when you've been sick for a while. I'm sorry, she said in English, which surprised me. I just had to get out of there. I'm Angela. We shook hands. You speak English, I said, noticing the huge ring on her thin finger. She was also wearing a gold bracelet. This was a rich girl. My stepfather was an American, she said. We spent a lot of time with him in New York before he died. Oh, I said, thinking, I see where the money came from now. My grandmother had already set out plates and bowls for the crab stew she had made. I ate like a fiend. I was starved. The beach always makes me extra hungry, even when I don't swim. Angela ate a few spoonfuls and put the bowl down. My grandmother put the bowl back in her hands. I spent all day catching the crabs and cooking them, senorita. Do me the honor of eating a little more. She was outrageous. She actually watched Angela as the poor kid forced it all down. You could tell it was an effort. Here is the secret weapon against anorexia, I thought. My grandmother. It wasn't long before the mother came out to get her daughter. We have to talk, she said. Mama and Papa nodded. It was part of the plan. I could see that. I was a little disappointed. 
I had really been looking forward to getting a little more information directly from the source. Angela looked at me as if she wanted to stay longer, too. Then Mama Anna spoke up. In two weeks, we are having a quinceañera party for Rita. I would like Angela to come. Angela smiled and kissed her on both cheeks. Mama hugged her like she did me. That is, so hard that you can't breathe. It didn't seem to take long for people to get familiar with each other around here. I had thought that the party had just been something Mama had made up at the beach, but it turned out that she meant it. Although the next two weeks were mainly the usual routines of eating too much, drinking café, watching telenovelas, and accompanying Papa to two more jobs, neither one as interesting as Angela's case, one turned out to be a simple problem of envy between two sisters, easily handled with special charms Papa carved for them himself, and the other was a cheating husband who was told he would be haunted forever by the restless spirit of a man shot by his wife if he did not give up womanizing. Mama and I spent some time shopping for my dress, with money Mama had had my mother send us, and for food and decorations for the house. It all seemed pretty childish, but on the island they make a big deal of a girl's turning 15. I wondered who she was going to invite besides Angela, since I didn't know anyone except old relatives like her. No problem. Parties are for everybody, she explained. Old relatives, neighbors, kids. Apparently, I was just the excuse to have a blowout. I chose a blue satin cocktail dress my mother would never have let me buy. Mama thought it was muy bonito, very pretty, even if we had to stuff a little toilet paper in the bra to fill out the bodice. The party started at noon on a Saturday. There was a ton of food set out on tables in the backyard under a mango tree, and there were Japanese lanterns hanging from the branches, which we would light when it got dark, and a portable record player, about 50 years old, ready to blast out salsa music. I had a few of my tapes of good music with me for my Walkman, but there was no player or stereo anywhere around. People piled into the house and hugged and kissed me. I was starting to get a headache when a long white limousine pulled up to the front of our house. Angela and her mother stepped out of it. I looked to see if the Mala Influencia man was with them, but the car drove away. A chauffeur, too. Wow. Everyone had stopped talking when Mama's big-mouthed neighbor shouted, Oh my God, it's Maribel Hernandez! And people crowded around her before she could step inside. I saw Angela trying politely to come through several large, sweaty women, and I reached for her hand and led her to my room. I had to shoo Ramon off my bed, where he was getting ready to crow before we sat down. Angela laughed at the crazy rooster, and I saw that she looked different. She didn't have that pale greenish color under her skin. She was still skinny, but she looked healthier. She winked at me and said, it worked. What worked? I had no idea what she was talking about. Outside my door, the noise level was climbing. People were pouring out into the yard, which was right outside my window. I saw Mama Anna dancing up a storm in the middle of a circle of people. When she had taken her bows, she started making her way through the crowd of short people like a small tank aiming right for my room. Papa Juan was taking Ramon around, apparently introducing him to the guests, or trying to keep him from getting trampled to death. I had to give him credit. He didn't seem to care if he made a fool of himself. But most people in town seemed to think he was pretty great. I watched him looking at each guest with his kind brown eyes, and I asked myself, whether he really could see inside their heads and their hearts. Your grandfather's cure. Mommy and I cleaned out house from top to bottom. No more bad influences left in it. The first thing we've done together in months. And best of all, she threw him out. Rita, Rita! It was my grandmother, yelling out for me over the noise of people, scratchy records, and a hysterical rooster. It's time to sing Feliz Cumpleaños! She looked great in her bright red party dress and seemed to be having a blast. She had this talent for turning every day into a sort of party. I had to laugh. I can't believe this, I said to Angela, falling back on the bed and putting my face under a pillow. She giggled and pulled the pillow away from me. You'll get used to it, she said. I wish I had a grandmother like yours. Both of mine are dead. You can borrow mine, I offered. Come on, she said, and we both jumped off the bed, with me nearly breaking my neck on my new high heels. The party was fun with Angela there. 
Even her mother seemed to be enjoying herself, although people constantly bugged her for autographs. I even saw somebody handing her a magazine with a toothpaste ad for her to sign. She just kept smiling and smiling. They stayed until after midnight, when the last person went home. Papa was snoring in his rocking chair, and Mama and Angela's mother were cleaning the kitchen. Angela and I talked in my room. We agreed to get together as much as possible until I had to go back home to Patterson. Even then, she said, she would come visit me. She had money to travel. I spent a lot of time at the pink house over the next weeks. I even began liking the color. I told Angela about Johnny Ruiz, even though I had not really thought about him, not as much anyway, in the last month. She said that he sounded like a troubled boy. A mala influencia, I suggested. We both laughed at the thought of Johnny's being followed around by a restless ghost. The whole thing with him and jo Joey Molieri and the mess with Melly's and my parents began to seem like a movie I had seen a long time ago. And one day, while we were walking down the beach after dinner, she told me about how hard her life had been, moving from place to place while her mother was trying to make it on TV. She had spent a lot of time with babysitters, especially after her father had left them when Angela was just five. Where is he now? I asked her. He lives in New York with his new family. I plan to go see him when I visit you. My mother only lets him come down once a year, but we've been talking about it and she thinks I can take care of myself now. See, he's not a bad man, but sometimes he drinks too much. That's what started the trouble between them. Then she told me about Mr. Jones, a rich guy who owned hotels. He had left them the pink house and a lot of money when he died in a small plane crash a year ago. Angela said that he had been a nice guy too, although not too interested in her, or in much else besides making money. But the man whom she really hated was the boyfriend who had recently been chased out by an evil spirit. Angela laughed when she said that, but got serious when she told me it had been a really awful time. That's when her mother had called in Don Juan, as she called Papa, for a consultation. Your mother seems like a smart person, I said. Does she really believe in all this ghost, evil, spirit, haunted house stuff? She's not the only one, Rita. Don't you see it took someone with special powers to drive out the bad influence in my house? She looked at me in a really serious way for a minute. Then she started giggling. Come on, she started running back to the house. It's time for the telenovela and my mother's new commercial. My family arrived in early August. We went to pick them up in three cars, with two more following for the welcoming committee. My mother kept looking at me at the airport. She acted like she was a little scared of coming too close. She had heard only from her mother about me since I had forgotten to write home, and she must have thought that Mama Anna was probably exaggerating when she wrote that I was having a great time and had not had an asthma attack in weeks. They had never gotten it straight on the asthma, which my mother figured was one of my tricks. She knew me a little. Finally, I gave her a break and came over and hugged her. You're so tanned, mi amor. Have you been to the beach a lot? I didn't want her to think it had all been a vacation, so I said, a few times. Have you seen Melly? She looked at me with a kind of sad look on her face, scaring me. I hadn't written to Melly either, so I didn't know whether she was dead or what. You don't know? She went on that retreat with the sisters, you know? It turned out that she liked it. So she won't be at Central High with you next year. I'm sorry, hija. Melly is going to start school at St. Mary's in the fall. I almost burst out laughing. Our parents had really come up with some awful punishments for Melly and me. I'd had one of the best summers of my life with Angela, and I was even really getting to know my grandparents, the ghost-busting magnificent duo. I had been taking medium lessons from them lately, and had learned a few tricks, like how to look really closely at people and see whether something was bothering them. I saw in my mother's eyes that she was scared I might hate her for sending me away. And she should have been, so I let her suffer a little. But then I squeezed in next to her in Papa's toy car, and held her hand while Mama Anna told her all the intimate details about me, including the fact that she had cured my asthma with a special tea she had made me drink. I looked at my mother and winked. She gave me a loud kiss on my cheek that made my ears ring. I know now where she picked up that bad habit. Since I already knew everything Mama Anna was going to tell my mother, 
being a mind reader myself now, I settled back to try to figure out how Melly and I were going to get together in September. I had heard St. Mary's basketball team had some of the best-looking guys. <laughs>